Hello and welcome to Metro Home Theater Tech Tips. I'm Brent McCall and with me is... Adam Rogers. Adam, what do we got today? Well, we uh, we were going to have an, an interview with JVC Screen Innovations as well as one other... Deep uh, Dive. Deep Dive AV, thank you. Uh, however, today uh, we had some scheduling conflicts so we had to push that back. Um, so definitely keep an eye on us. It's going to be back, I believe, uh, we picked out the 20... No, I'm sorry. Like two Fridays from now, basically. Okay. Um, uh, the, the information will be up uh, as soon as possible. But... In its place today, we're going to be talking about AVR, HDMI problems and solutions. Because we have been getting calls on this. Yes, we have. Um, so some of the big problems that we've been getting, of course, uh, come down to things like multi-output uh, AVRs, um, having, you know, going to two different displays, whether it be a, a TV and a projector or two TVs uh, or two projectors, depending on that. But we've been getting calls about that and that stuff. So we wanted to talk about that because we have an opportunity to actually talk about it so okay so let's ship, flip up the graphic that you made for us let me go ahead and get that up there I got to push a couple extra now, buttons one here. of the things we're talking about here is not matrixes it's not splitters it's actually dual outputs on AVRs as you can see from this graphic you have your sources going into your 4k HDR AVR pick a brand any brand yep and you have mirrored outputs meaning output one and output two are both doing the same thing Unfortunately, here's what happens. Now, I get to draw at this point. Oop, almost. So, we have the AVR, and we got our two displays. Now, I'm gonna do one as a projector, and one as a flat panel. Trade. Ooh, okay. We'll get you a brand new marker. Thank you, I'm gonna take another color. There you go. So, we're coming out of port one to one display, port two to the other display. And you think, okay, it's an AVR, everything's gonna get negotiated, it's all gonna work out great. Here's the problem. Generally, you'll have one display working correctly all the time, and that will typically be the television. Right. The second display, in this case the projector, the, will work sometimes, but not all the time. In fact, the only time it really works all the time is if you physically disconnect the TV from the AVR. But that kind of sucks. You can't have your customer going back there, plugging and unplugging wires every time. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? When you look into the system again, typically the TV always works or one of the TVs always works, the other display does not. Now, why this is happening is a disparity in EDID. Now, anybody that's watched any of my live shows knows that EDID is the who are you, what are you, what's your resolution, bit rate, color, do you want audio, if so, what kind, and finally, can you provide me with the secret HDCP handshake? Scooch over. So, We've already got a great comment. We've got Dorrance uh, oh, on hey. his, with his, hey Dorrance, how's it going? Or Dorrance Supply, everybody. Great to have you on. Uh, he's saying, AVRs never cause problems. <laughs> yeah, he's being funny. I but love those. when this happens, again, typically you have to disconnect the one device that always works to make the second device that doesn't always work, work. Right. Fortunately, there is a solution for this. And we actually developed this solution because of this problem. Now, if you will switch me over to, this is the HDMI AIO2. Now, this is a phenomenal repair tool that literally encompasses everything we have learned in the last 15 years about EDID management, power management, power control, and triggers for the HDMI system. So what the AIO allows us to do specifically in this case, you will notice in the overhead photo, there is a Phoenix plug. Now, this Phoenix plug ties to a relay and a control system. And if you don't have a control system, check out our CS-IR kit, CCUS, that has code learning built-in relays as an IR connecting block. But with this, when you put this on the TV that always works. Now, this is important because in this application, we're not running both TVs on at the same time. We're watching either A or B, never A and B. So we put the AIO on the TV that always works. And the reason for this is that TV always works. Yeah. It's the other TV that's not happy with the EDID from the TV that always works. So when we put the AIO on whatever output always works, A or B, one or two, doesn't matter. When you're not watching that TV, you open the relay on your control system. Now when you do this, the AIO, for all practical purposes, has disconnected the HDMI cable between that always working display and your AVR. This means that the second display never gets that EDID 
conflict. So let's actually let's talk a little bit about the actual programming inside of a control system with this, because you and I take um, very similar steps for this, but very so somewhat different uh, di differing steps for this. So me being control forward uh, trained, you being classically Crestron trained, um, kind of w we handle things a little bit differently. So for me, you know, with dealing with the different rooms and, and aspects for that. What, what I wind up doing is taking the, uh, the, the, the macro for it, essentially, and basically whenever, we, whenever I turn on that room or turn on the TV that I'm watching, I will uh, open that relay and then close that relay. At the end of it, of course, when I'm turning off that TV, I do an open relay on that anyways. That way, every single time that I'm switching to a different source or a different device to watch, it's always going to open it and close it. And then if just in some weird case, it doesn't have it, that relay open, when I'm going to watch it after being off, I'm still sending that open command just in case. Very similar, we treat it in the Crestown world and others, it's mm -hmm. called a stepper. Will you switch me over, sir? I can, yep. Uh, okay, and of see. course this is not dry yet. So, in a stepper, what you're gonna do for the Crestron guys. Ooh, that's out of focus. You're gonna have your input command, whatever you call it, you know, TV one on. First thing you're gonna do on TV one on is you're gonna open relay to TV two. And of course, then that goes to your set reset command in your control system. Right. Then the next thing you're gonna do is close relay to TV one. Now, this is if you have two AIOs in your system, one for TV1, one for TV2, and sometimes you have to do that. Right. If, however, you only have one relay. For TV1, we're just gonna eliminate that line because we don't need it. Right. So we're gonna close relay for TV, then we're gonna turn on TV, and select source and TV or AVR. Now, when we turn TV2 on, mm -hmm. TV1 relay opens. When we do this, at this point, this TV has been effectively completely disconnected from the HDMI system. So it's no longer even communicating EDID with the AVR. By doing this, there's only one TV now connected, and that is the troublesome TV that only works when it's alone. And the reason for that, you, you had a really good analogy when we were talking about it before. Um, you were talking about how you've got this one person who is a, 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 a restaurateur. He's, he, he's an aficionado of, of you know, oh, yeah. certain tastes. And so he's very picky about what he, what he wants TVs, to, to have. Some TVs are happy-go-lucky, diners, dives, and... Um, Dry, dry, diners, drive-ins, and, and drive-ins. Yeah. They'll, they'll pretty much eat anything you put on their plate. Yeah. This is that one TV that always works. I don't care what happens, this TV works. Yep. However, you got that one guy. If it ain't perfect, mm -hmm. he's going to send it back. He's going to send it back. Now, I don't care what brand TV you buy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a diners, dives, and drive-ins, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's that. I'm only going to go to the best. Right. You know, a Budweiser drinker and that high-end wine drinker. Yeah. So when you have, and you, running with that analogy, when you have two picky eaters, or you have the one picky eater and not so picky eater, give the picky eater what he wants because right. the other one doesn't care. Doesn't care. He's, he's going to take he's it. Gonna he, just he's going to eat it, right? Yeah. Yes. So you want to have this guy be the, the one this, you turn off. The one you turn off. Right. You want to turn off the not picky eater because he's affecting the picky eater by, he looks over and sees his plate with the sloppy joe and some french fries and maybe some coleslaw. And he's like, you, 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 no, I'm not staying here. Right. However, there are times when you get two of the picky eaters. Right. And if you have two picky eaters in that application, you do need two of the AIOs because we have to completely disassociate them from each other. Both of them at the same. Now, yeah. An interesting thing came up for us yesterday here. Mm -hmm. We were attempting to add a GoPro. Oh, that's right, yes. To our ATEM. Yes. Now, an ATEM is a video switcher for 
broadcast. Yep, it's it's our uh, when, whenever we switch cameras here, that's the software and, or the hardware that we're using to actually make that switch. So what we've noticed is, and, and we're trying to set up some new camera angles for everybody, um, get, get some really interesting you know uh, features and stuff and views for different products and whatnot. So we we hooked up a GoPro, uh, and actually before I go too far, guys, questions and comments as always, please put them down in the uh, in the chat while we're here live, or if you are coming in after we are live and you're watching this as a playback, still leave your questions and comments down below. Uh, give us a like, give us a, a subscribe so that you can get all of our information uh, up front. Um, do the whole thing where you hit the bell so you get all the, all of the notifications about when we go live. Make and us feel good. Like that. Yeah, make us feel good. It also lets us know that we're doing things the right way. Um, again, before we noticed that uh, all of our viewers are, we're in the, the ballpark of about 80% 80% uh, or plus uh, of our viewers are not subscribed. So give us a uh, uh, hit, hit that subscribe button, hit the little bell thing so you get notified whenever we go live for these videos, um, and leave your questions and comments down below. Uh, today, uh, we are going to do a giveaway today. Um, what are we giving away? Well, at this point, I think we're going to do some swag. Okay. Uh, we've got some extra swag laying around, so I think we're going to give some stuff away that's got some Metro stuff on it. We may even have some JVC and some uh, screen innovation stuff that we haven't given okay. away yet. Um, so, best question, best comment uh, down below uh, of this video will win uh, some swag for us today. So, but let's um, get back to the ATEM. Back to what we were talking about. So, the ATEM, what we're going to do is we're going to hook up the GoPro to it and no picture and trying to figure out why that, that was so, the case. And we took our typical solution tools. Yep. The uh, JR3. Yep. The and AIO2. The AIO2. Yep. And it didn't work. So, unfortunately, we had to do something that, let's face it, we're men, we don't like to do. Yeah. We looked up the information online. Yes, we did. And what did we find? The main thing that we found was that there is some kind of, we, at first we thought it was a frame rate issue because when you have different types of frame rates going into this type, this particular device, it doesn't like it. And so it, tried, it wants to have the same frame rate for all of them. Well, we were. Technically, from what the information was being given to the, dis, to the, the ATEM or the display at this point was the same frame rate as the other TVs. And now, now that to was, verify this, of course, yep. we got our Meridio EDID reader. Yeah. And so with the Meridio Reader, it spit out that it was the same resolution and the same frame rate as the rest of the, uh, of, of the cameras. However, come to find out that the output of the GoPro is a set output. I cannot change the output to a different... And it doesn't always match the EDID. Uh, exactly. So what we did from there, we ran And with this the, was his uh, idea. Yeah, uh, um, trying to find a solution here and, and mostly just for us to learn how it works and whatnot and figure it out because we like to... We're always learning stuff around here. Uh, you, you can see, again, things are a mess here, but that's because we're a working lab. You guys are seeing us in our environment. It's like you're going out to the Serengeti and you're looking at the gazelles. This is us. We are working here. This is what, where we work. So, Thank you. <laughs> I feel much better being compared to a gazelle now. Well, well anyways. Uh, so with that being said, when we go, we, we want to learn about this. So we tried it out, and we started putting some different devices on there. And we have a really cool piece. It's the, the CS-HDM. Two, uh, no, sorry, one Three. X two, one X four, Three. and a one X eight. Eight SPL five. SPL five, um, and the SPL five basically means that it's the newest generation. It's the fifth generation of the splitter. Uh, it's a one by four, uh, one by two, or one by four, and there's also a one by eight available. Um, but what the special thing with those is, is it's a splitter scaler, and so it fixes it fixes EDID issues between right. and Adam plugged it in. Voila, we got picture. We got picture now. We still, we're honestly, we're speculating on this because what the E did of the camera is telling us is not what's happening to the ATEM. So there's definitely some interesting things going on there. But to get back to the dual output AVR question. Yes. Nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100. Right. The AIO2 is going to fix this. Now, if you'll pop back over to the AIO2 for a I second will. there. Let's see, we'll that Again, there. when you're looking at the AIO2, I'm going to walk over here. Okay. You've got a Phoenix plug on it. Now, this Phoenix plug, again, ties to your control system. All of this is is just contact closure recognition, meaning it's either open or it's closed. When it's closed, when your contact closure on your system's closed, the AIO2 is fully functioning and the AVR sees the display. Right. When it's open, again, the cable's disconnected. Now, your first thought is, well, wouldn't I put this on the TV that's giving me a problem? Yeah. The, because it's the one giving me the problem. Well, that was my first thought because we, we got a call yesterday. And that's where uh, all this spawned uh, uh, from. Tuesday. 
Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? Tuesday. Okay. We're so getting old. We, we, I know, right? We're forgetting what, what day we're on. Um, so this all started because of that call. And on that call, we had two different televisions. We had an, an AVR in place. And when he put the same television on both sides, because he had an extra one laying around, so we put both on the same side, not laying around, it was for another, another room. And when he put it there, everything worked perfectly fine. Now, in that situation, he wanted to watch both displays at the same time. However, the, the reality was, was the second TV for out, Zone Out 2 was going to be that other brand of television right. in its place. So it turns out, from what we're realizing now, that second brand was a pickier eater, so to speak, going back to that, that analogy. Uh, analogy, whereas the, the original one doesn't really care. It's going to show basically whatever you give it. So in that case, where do we put the AIO2? The, the AIO2 goes on the, I'm happy with anything television. Right. Why? Because it's the one causing the problem. For the picky eater. Right. Because it really doesn't care what it sees, but because of that, it's allowing a greater variance right. than the picky eater is. Now, if you have to put both TVs on at the same time, mm -hmm. this is where we come back to the same solution that we have with the ATEM. Right. You would put one of the splitters that does the auto scaling and auto clocking right in there. The drawback is you cannot separate it from different outputs or the audio. So it's something to understand on that. You have to look at the entire job and what the application is for what you're doing. Now, the AIO2 also does a number of other things. The AIO2 will provide voltage and current supplementation on the TMDS feeds. Why this is important when you look at an active cable, a fiber cable, or a lot of the extenders out there, they are actually required to power the output of the previous device. So if you've got an extender, it actually has to power the output of the AVR. And it may not always have enough current, particularly if you're using thinner gauge wires to make it more flexible in a rack. The AIO2 provides voltage and current for that. It also provides voltage and current for five volt and hot plug and resolves voltage variance problems in the EQ settings of EDID. This is particularly important to you guys that are installing kaleidoscapes. Right. Because it is a huge Kaleidoscape problem solver, which is not to say there's anything wrong with the Kaleidoscape. There's not. It's just the Kaleidoscape's a little bit narrower in their interpretation of the EDID spec than a lot of other devices are. They're, they're, uh, if we go back to that analogy, it's, it's very... Uh, they're, they're picky. They're, they're, they're picky, but they're not the picky eaters. They're the picky providers. They're the ones where you have to be all dressed up in yeah, order you're not to go into that the restaurant, restaurant without a tux on. Yeah, exactly. So, Suit and tie only. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that the unpicky eater can't go in. He just needs to dress up a little bit, and then he's in, right? And that's what the AO does for him. It puts a coat and a tie on him. There you go. So, um, so some of the other problems that we run into, because, uh, you know, again, guys, leave your questions and comments down in the, in the comments down below. Um, or if you've run into an issue with an AVR of some kind, give us that scenario. Tell us what, what kind of issue you ran into. I what would also like to mention that on our matrixes, mm -hmm. when you look on our matrixes in the serial commands, you have the ability to trip hot plug on and off on any of those outputs. Right. So you don't have to have an AIO too if you were using our matrix because all that's built into our matrix. Right. When we were developing this, we already had figured out this problem. Yeah. So, so we, we were able to the add ability that. to stay ahead of the game. Exactly. And so then that way you don't have to buy, you know, for instance, if you get our 8x8 matrix, you don't have to buy eight of the AIO2s. Um, where, but if you really want to buy eight of them, we're not going to stop you because, you know, obviously we're here to make some money. But in the long run, you don't need to do it because it's already built directly into the matrix. Now, if you do want to buy eight of something, buy eight of the surge protectors. Yes. Uh, the surge protectors definitely are good to have on, your, on the inputs and the outputs of the matrix yes. as well. Yes, anything so that has serial connection, IP connection, or coax or ethernet plugged into it, those are the primary planes of entrance for ESD spikes. Right. So let's talk about HDR okay. and AVRs. Okay. Because one of the big problems that we get is that somebody has a source device, and let's say it's a Roku or an Apple TV, something that is giving an HDR signal. They have an, uh, um, a television it says that HDR. is HDR and they've got their receiver that is HDR, it's capable. However, when they try to send it through, they're not getting an HDR picture, or they don't get a picture at all. This is not uncommon, because strangely enough, the AVR manufacturers assume you don't have an HDMI display and an HDR source. Right. So inside of all these devices, including your display, is an enhanced option. Now, it may say HDR, but typically they call it enhanced. Right. 
Now, if you do not go in and turn on enhanced, it is not going to recognize the EDID metadata for HDR. So basically, when you look at EDID, there's two levels. There's the original EDID, which mm -hmm. handled all the, you know, the stuff that we've seen up to this date. And then there's the new EDID. This handles deep color HDR. Now, if you don't recognize this new level, you only go to grade 6, not to grade 12, mm -hmm. you're not going to understand the math. Mm -hmm. So the source, the AVR, the display, just ignore each other. Now, if the display, for example, is set to enhanced, but the AVR is not set to enhanced, the display and the AVR are not even speaking the same language. Right. So there's a good chance the system will fail. You will also see this on sources. This is a problem on cable boxes. So if you have your TV set to enhanced, you have your AVR set to enhanced, but then you've got your cable box, which doesn't have an enhanced option 99.99999% right. of the time. You want some more nines on there? I, we might need them. Yeah. Um, you may not get a picture. Now, modern AVRs, in the very early days, when you turn on enhanced, it was enhanced for every input. Mm -hmm. There was no option. Sony was the first to allow you selectable right. enhancements on the AVR inputs. I think others are now adding that. However, it can be hard to find. Yeah. I have uh, an AVR at home that had not somebody not sent me the manual from Europe. You wouldn't have known how I to do it. I never would have found it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can definitely become a, a difficult thing because, and again, this comes down to uh, a, a, a restriction from HDMI uh, procedure at, at, on its own because what happens is we have all these different edit information pieces going across this, uh, this very intricate system. And if you get an odd edited information pattern and it's trying to send that information through, you may run into a conflict. Well, this is also very similar in the AIO3 repair tool for this that we see with Roku's, Apple TVs, mm -hmm. and Direct TVs. If you'll go back to the overhead for a yeah. second, when you look at these devices, there are actually two HDMI chipsets in them a 1.4 chipset and a 2.0. Now, the reason you have two chipsets is the old chipset obviously doesn't go forward to what this does because those feature sets did not exist. However, they did not have the time, money, or inclination yet, and I'm sure this will change, to combine these in one chipset because there was already a ton of these out there. So you have a traffic cop to determine which way the data goes. This traffic cop is triggered by the hot plug. Now, it is not uncommon in DirecTV, Apple TVs, and Roku's when you're watching your 4K HDR deep color good stuff, mm -hmm. and you go back to a non-4K HDR not quite good stuff, or basic 4K anyway, that you will get mode out of range, picture out of range, static, purple, green, all sorts of weirdness until you physically unplug the cable and plug it back in. The EDID control and the hot plug reset feature built into the AIO2 which again goes to the Phoenix plug on it, allows you to force this hot plug reset. With this, you resolve those issues. So when you're setting up your system, you want to put a magic button or a help button or an easy button on the remote for your customer. Sir, if something happens, hit this. Now, another problem we have seen a lot more of, in fact, I just did a quickie Q&A on it, is cable boxes. You turn your TV off at night, picture's great, everything's working fine. You go back in the morning, you turn your TV on, the cable box is on, and you get no picture. What's happening here is the exact same thing. It's an EDID miscommunication. When you turn the TV off, the TV's not actually off. The hot plug is still turned on going back to the cable box. But when you turn the TV back on, it doesn't know its previous EDID settings. Even though hot plug is not turned off, it doesn't know where it was. So the cable box does also not know to resend and renegotiate. If you put an AIO2 on the system, every time you turn the cable box off, you open the relay. So effectively, you have again unplugged the TV from the cable box. When you turn the TV on in the morning, the last step you do in that macro is close the relay. It now renegotiates everything and everybody's happy. If you do not have a control system, what I recommend again is our CS-IR kit CCUS, which has a programmable A close, B close, or what we call normally closed, normally open functions on the relay. You teach it the TV on and the TV off commands. TV on closes the relay, TV off opens the relay. 
It's that simple. It solves almost all of those problems. It solves similar problems with DirecTV, Apple TV, and Roku. So you can actually see that there. I pulled it up there in the background. The IR kit CCUS, he's right. If you, for some reason, uh, aren't doing a control system that has a relay built into it, or if you have a control system that- uh, And no me, ports left. No, no ports left or whatever it is, throw that on there because you can learn an OE command from the cable box remote, or you can come up with a random command that you want to throw in there that it can learn to do the open and the close. Yep. So it's a good piece, good piece to have whenever you're doing some troubleshooting. So um, some, of the, some of the other problems that, that we're running into, uh, of course, and this, this is going to happen as we move forward into HDMI 2.1. Oh, yeah. So with HDMI, uh, the jump from uh, 1.4 to 2.0, and now the jump from 2.0 to 2.1, you have some systems that are being left in the past. And so yeah. we, have to have, we have to come up with some way of getting that information the audio information uh, to the uh, the AVR, but still keep that nice, pristine 8K or 4K picture. Went back to picture. a tech call from not a town far away last week. Yeah, exactly. So in that in that type of situation, uh, there's many ways to go about doing it. One of them, if you have one of the things that, that we found out, of course, that he had an HDMI matrix in place. So in his situation, no, it was our matrix. It, um, yeah, yeah, it was. So uh, I don't know if it was or not. It was, and it had it was, the audio out on it. No, okay, two, two different calls then. We're, we're, ah. we're thinking about two different calls. So the one that he's thinking about, it did. It had the audio breakout, and so it was very simple. You just break out the audio from the HDMI, either the output on the matrix or the input, which ours has the capability of selecting if you which want you to track. track the output or the input. And so you can then make sure that that audio source is always going to that AVR. The nice thing is, is that it does do the Dolby breakout. Um, so on the digital uh, connection, which is a digital coax, digital coax, you can actually still get the Dolby audio out to that. Not Atmos, because Atmos requires HDMI. However, all, all the other Dolby signals. Well, here's you can the thing: through. if you have an older AVR, you're not going to be doing Atmos anyway. You're going to be doing Atmos anyway, right? So now, the other guy we recommended the switch on. So he actually no, this this one's different. We got a so third one. We have a third one then. So with him, what he had was the the, the HDMI matrix. Ah, right. Um, and what he did was he took our ABO three, and originally he was going to use it with an Apple TV because for some reason all of the media uh, um, streaming uh, manufacturers out there, Roku, uh, Apple TV, Amazon, all these uh, all the big guys, uh, for some reason they deemed it was a smart idea to go ahead and remove the Toslink uh, output on their stream or streaming boxes, which. Well, that's an entire thing on its own. But um, what he was going to do is he was going to use our ABO3, which is the audio breakout on the HDMI between the Apple TV and the Switch. Uh, and then from there, he was going to take the audio and go to another uh, audio switch of some kind. However, he was running into a problem. The problem was is that when he plugged in, when he, without it in place, he had picture. When he, as soon as he put that in place, he lost picture, which... We had a discussion about this before, and that issue is primarily down to the point where when you have as when you start adding more and more devices into the signal you're path gonna on an HDMI, you're going to go over that threshold of failure point to where you no longer have a picture. Because while HDMI is great for its connection capabilities, it has issues when you put in too many devices because you're adding in tolerances into that connection. It's meant connection. to be few connections, point A to point B. Exactly. Really, so, source directly into TV right. was the intent. So in his situation, luckily he had an extra output on the matrix, and so he was able to put... That's right, he had the HD base T and the mirrored HDMI exactly. output. Exactly. So he did, uh, he for the, the mirrored connection, that one TV was HD base T uh, uh, for a longer distance, but it also mirrored that output on the HDMI. So he was able to take the HDMI output at the matrix put the ABO3 onto it, which does not require something on the head end for it to get the audio. Uh, so you don't have to have a display connected to it to get the EDIT information. You can plug it in without it. It works like an AVR. It. Exactly. So then you plug it in that way and you're able to break out the audio and he was able to get the stereo audio that way. Now, of course, both of those, you don't do down mixing, so you do have to make sure to set your source to PCM. Or Dolby Digital if you have an AVR that can accept it. Yeah, if you're gonna be doing, if you're gonna be doing analog audio, PCM, if you're going to be doing the digital audio, they both will handle Dolby audio out of the digital connection. So The one I was thinking about, we had him put, he had an older AVR, and mm -hmm. the manufacturer that he wanted to buy is unable to ship right now. Yes, yes. And that is evidently not an uncommon problem today. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, same reason why we're doing our social distancing yes. at this point. Um, uh, but we, I had him do the switch, mm -hmm. because it is a 4K HDR all the good stuff, deep color switch. Right. But it also gives coax and analog output. So he's able to come out of our switch mm -hmm. directly into the AVR. And honestly, the AVR, for, forget the Atmos, the AVR could not go beyond 1080p. Right. It was just too old. 
and he also needed more jacks than he had. So this gave him extra jacks. Yep. Gave him the ability to not have to worry about the AVR today. Yep. And probably not in the future. Not for a while, yeah. Because it works. Yeah. And it was probably, two I think he told me it's a $2,000 Denon when he put it in. Yeah, when it was brand new, it was, it was still up there at that point. So he so can continue to use it. Especially for years. If he's, if he's not going to take advantage of the Atmos uh, surround sound or the DTS. Right. Uh, sur um, you know, well, I still like DTS. 3D. Well, uh, pardon me, the, the, um, I'm forgetting the, the, the name for it, but it's, it's the when you've Their got version Atmos, of Atmos and then, yeah, uh, the, other, the other type for it. But that one, uh, if you're not going to be adding the extra speakers to get that, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, at that point. While Dolby Atmos does have the capabilities of having a better Some sound better quality, steering. you know, for to be in, in different areas, you to really gain anything from it, you need that extra You speaker. need the overhead for the... Right. So, really cool setup for that. So, um, Dat is asking, uh, hey, Dat. Um, Ciao, I am Dat Gwen. <laughs> what is another term manufacturers are using other than enhanced? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. And it could say HDR, it could say... We've seen some odd ones here. Yeah, there's. Uh, I've seen enhanced. I've seen HDR. I've seen HDMI add-ons or, or or additions or. Um, the or problem is enhanced is the quote unquote recognized statement, but right. it's not the required right statement. Sony's enhanced. Yeah. Sony uses the word enhanced. Um, uh, I, I believe. Denon, I think uses. Uh, Denon, I think, uses HDR for theirs, or, or 4K HDR, uh, or uh, Deep Color, maybe even. Uh, I think no, I've seen those somewhere. No, you get Deep Color without the HDR. The problem is that we don't have an answer to that because we haven't seen everything out there, and we sometimes have to hunt this stuff down ourselves, and there's it can a take a while. Yeah, there's a lot. So, um, I but mean, what, what you guys don't really see in the rack is we've got pretty much some of everything over there. Uh, or at least we try to. Yeah, um, Xboxes, Xbox One X, One S, Apple TVs, Roku's, my boxes, Blu-ray players, HDR Blu-ray players, 3D Blu-ray players, we've Sony got AVR. We got LG. Denon we've got AVR. Denon. Denon yeah, Oppo. LG. We had a Yamaha <laughs> AVR. So we've got pretty much everything, and sadly, there's no consistency with this. And yeah. Which is unfortunate, but the, um, that's kind of where we're at. Anything you guys find that we haven't, please share it with us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let us know what what, what you see for that. So, uh, Brent, I think uh, other than that, we don't have any other questions or comments at, at this moment. point. At, at the moment, um, was don't there anything else? Subscribe, like, share, uh, send money. Yeah, money's good. I'm not proud. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely uh, hit the subscribe button so that we can go ahead and make sure that you guys get these videos more often. Uh, leave your comments down in the description, uh, or not, not in the description, in the comments below or in the live chat. If you're watching after the live stream, put it in the comments. Um, let us know what you have run into. Even just something maybe seems mundane. You know, go ahead and let us know what, what's going on with it, or if you see something really interesting that you're at that's happening out there with the AVRs. And I hate to sound like some of the other manufacturers out there, Regardless of what it is, there has to be a first person. You're, you know, you could be the first one to tell us this. Yeah, yeah. And it's it certainly not a week goes by that we don't learn something new, and sometimes right. it's day to day. Right. Uh, we're here, and we try to understand and know as much as that we can. But you guys are out in the field; you will see things before we do, nine times out of ten. Right. So. Everybody Stop who's us. watching, yeah, let, uh, bring bring your questions for us. And, you know, um, as always, uh, thank you for checking in with us today. Uh, we have some other videos coming up. We have next Wednesday. Uh, we uh, we are doing next Wednesday and next Friday. We're doing uh, videos at 3 p.m. Uh, and then we have pushed uh, what today's episode was going to be uh, with JVC Screen Innovations and Deep Dive AV. We are pushing that back to the Friday after next, which I believe is the 8th. Uh, so next fiber next Friday is next fi Fiber Friday. Fiber Friday. Thank you very fiber much. Friday. Yeah. And what is on Wednesday, sir? I'm trying to remember what, what Wednesday, what we set up for Wednesday. And I, I've got it written down somewhere. We'll make sure to put it down, down in the description <laughs> below. I am, <laughs> it's, been, it's been one heck of a week, Brent, uh, for what we've been dealing with here. So Yes, and of course, but the links to this will be posted up on Remote Central yep. and Integration Pros. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Please subscribe. And what's most important? Reboot your equipment. Early and often. I'm Brent McCall. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you. We'll see you next time.